anytime I'm showing something or, or if I'm uh, if I'm saying something and if you can't see what I'm seeing, please, please let me know. OK, all right. So um, good morning, everybody. Uh, for today's session, we are looking at uh, an, an aspect of uh, um, comparative literature, which is this theme of uh, identity politics. Uh, if you've been following what's been happening in, in America uh, uh, this last few days, um, it's been a horrendous amount of um, anger and frustration over the way uh, a member of the, the nation had been treated, uh, an African-American man, and the way he was treated and finally killed uh, by a police. And, and it all boils down to this issue of identity uh, and how identity is a marker that shows uh, how others can treat us or how others can respond to us. So that's the politics of, of identity. And that's the bit that I want to talk about uh, for today's session. We've got a couple of videos that I want to go through. We've got a few literary texts that we, we would go through as well uh, from different contexts. And then we have some uh, aspects of identity politics that I want to deliberate with. So if you have any questions, I would really uh, um, encourage you to post it in the chat section uh, if you can. Are you able to get to the chat section of your of your um, themes, everyone? Yes. Yes, I'm there. Even, even those using the phone. Are you, is anyone on the phone uh, right now? Yes, I am. Yeah. So can you get to the chat section or the Q and A section of themes? I don't think so. Hmm. But can I just encourage you to write questions down as you are listening to me uh, uh, and then we have a conversation afterwards and then we can come back to whatever bits that you, uh, you know, whichever slide or uh, whichever bits that we discuss that you've got a question on. Please engage uh, later, OK? All right. OK. So, so um, just a quick recap, you know, we've we've kind of left comparative literature um, you know, um, a while back since we, we had class uh, in UKM, uh, specifically about the definition of comparative literature as well as the structure from which we conduct uh, text, reading of text across time and space. So a quick recap is necessary, all right? That's the first thing that I want to get started with. And, and following that, I want to look at uh, the focus of comparative literature vis-a-vis -vis the issue of identity politics. So that will be a parameter in itself, right? So you've had other parameters prior to this. So uh, uh, the theme of identity politics is a parameter in itself that you can look at texts from different cultural contexts, political contexts, geographical contexts. All right. So, so just a quick recap about comparative literature. If you recall uh, this this um, quote, um, you know, can everybody mute their mic uh, for for now? And later, when we open it during uh, discussion section, then you can unmute it. Thank you. So this this quotation, I I started the course with this. If you remember, um, you know, a couple of months back, it's been a while. But this, co this quotation kind of sums up why uh, we do comparative literature. And I quote, every Irish ballad has already been tracked down. Every chapter, almost every sentence releases lovingly dissected, debated, and reinterpreted. What can possibly be left to say? In this circumstance, cross-cultural comparisons prove to be marvelously illuminating and refreshing. So, OK, so we we looked at a, a text, you know, a couple of hundred years old uh, um, text, uh, Pride and Prejudice, and it that has been read, that text has been read, you know, lovingly, you know, debated and interpreted and reinterpreted and revisioned and all the rest of it. So what else is there left to say about Pride and Prejudice, for instance? 
only through the act of comparing with texts from various cultural contexts, as you yourself have done, are you now able to see a new perspective, a new dimension, you know, uh, if you compare the text with, with, uh, with a, a text written in the uh, Indian um, uh, context or a text written from a Chinese perspective or a text written from a Muslim perspective. Uh, you see the dimension of similarities and differences between Pride and Prejudice and this other text. There lies the value of comparison, you know, that, that aspect of seeing the text from different perspective, seeing the same issue of the text from different perspective. That's one of the reasons why comparative literature is of value. And, and another thing that kind of we need to keep in mind Sorry, I've, I've lost, I've um, forgotten to put the references. I'll make sure I put the references in before I this up on UKM Folio. Uh, and another quote that, that emphasizes the importance of comparative literature is this one. More than the word literature, it is the interest of comparative which allow practitioners of comparative literature to distinguish their work from that done within strictly national uh, and national linguistic boundaries. And to say with some rigor that comparative literature is not simply a matter of adding, juxtapositioning one national literature to another so that its existence is simply you know, redundant and superfluous. So the idea that you know sometimes when, when you do a text set within a particular national border like Malaysian literature and English, you do appreciate the text for what it is. But it is only when you start to read texts from other national borders that you start to value both the Malaysian text as well as that other text in terms of, of the nuances, the similarities and the universal connections that texts appear to have, almost like the author of the Malaysian text read the author of the other text and was influenced by them, perhaps. You know, that's the kind of like the potency that you see in text when you read it um, comparatively. Now we come to the, the kind of like um, the issue in the 21st century. One of the things that we talked about, if you remember, with comparative literature in the 20th century is how Euro American Eurocentric it is, you know. The, the Euro-US centric uh, uh, of the discipline largely stems from the fact that the scholars from Euro and US uh, schools of comparative literature have been uh, the primary force of how comparative literature is defined, structured, studied, uh, and even evaluated through their reports, their every you know, uh, 10 year report of comparative literature, the, uh, the American Comparative Literature Association, ACLA. Uh, but, but as we go you know, past the 20th century, coming into the 21st century, one of the things that, that uh, scholars coming from the uh, outside the Euro-US uh, uh, center, one of the things that they are debating for or, or towards is the need to remove the fences, you know, that, that uh, distinguish the the you know US U, uh, Euro US kind of perspective and the rest of the world, and this this quote from Pratt is is valuable for that perspective. Uh, and the quote is the impression they give us the impression they give is that to be in the field of comparative literature is to be a farmer always walking the fences and patching them up to make sure nothing wild gets in and nothing valuable gets out, sorry, it's out. No unforeseen matings and cross breeding occur. So the, the words like wild, valuable, invaluable, you know, always remember what um, um, Pierre Machere talked about. You see what is present and you see also what is absent. So when you think about nothing wild gets in, the indirect message is what is currently available is not wild is tame or is you know whatever it's opposite of of wild domesticated or cultured or civilized right and nothing valuable gets out let me just correct that before can i correct that now i can't okay uh, uh you know that that aspect of nothing valuable gets out 
Oh, yes, I can. So, so that shows that what is inside the parameter of comparative literature is valuable, and what is outside, i.e. the wild, right? This aspect of the wild, it, it kind of has a very derogatory uh, connotation, you know? So this kind of uh, uh, describing comparative literature from that binary of that fencing needs to be broken up. You know, that's the politics of, of the definition that needs to be, um, um, you know, uh, re-looked at and even contested and that's where we come in scholars and students from outside the the euro us center i i hope you're you're following me so far uh, so that comes to the methodology you know so how then do we conduct comparative literature this is a quote from basnet you know again it's it's from the 20th century but it's still valuable even now so i'm not saying whatever whatever the scholars of the 20th century says is useless, is not applicable to us. No, there are things that they they have um, identified that is valuable and can be used in our context, but you have to read it and, and um, identify it accordingly. So this is what Susan Bassnett said in her uh, book, uh, Comparative Literature and Introduction. Uh, and I quote, the comparison of one text with another without contextual reference is a formalist exercise that rapidly becomes tedious. So if you read a text, uh, Born a Crime or um, The Hate You Give, and you just read it for the text in itself without reading it within the context of which the text was produced, it's a tedious exercise. There is no value in it. The same with um, if you read uh, The Yellow Bird or if you read uh, The Corpse Washer and you just read it for whatever whatever is in the story without putting the story within the context from which the story or the narrative develop, you're not reading the text for its potential. You know, so that's the first thing that we need to think about when we talk, we talk about the methodology. You have to read the text within the context from which uh, the, the text was developed. And in order to do that, you need to find out the social, historical, cultural context of the, the text. That's the first part of your methodology that you need to kind of um, identify. All right. And another part is also you as a student. What is, is it that you are interested in? You know, and I, I take this position, I take Rorty's um, I take Rorty's um, position in terms of how I approach comparative literature in this class with you, if you have noticed. And I, and I quote, students receive plenty of suggestions about what sorts of books they might like to read and are then left free to follow their noses. You know, you know, and reading it out loud, suddenly it feels like, oh my God, I, I've just associated students with a pack of dogs, you know, <laughs> they're just following their noses and, and seeing where that takes them. But that's not the point. The point being, you actually have a choice uh, in terms of how you approach comparative literature. The methodology comes from you. What are you interested in? Are you interested in the issue of identity? Are you interested in um, uh, the kind of language being used? Um, are you interested in a particular theme? What are you interested in? And that develops your, that helps develop your methodology, you know, and based on that methodology, you identify theoretical framework, a lens that will help you uh, study the text comparatively. OK, so the methodology of how you choose to read the text across time and space is as important as the choice of text that you take. I hope I'm, I'm making I'm making sense uh, because it's really, really difficult to gauge your um, understanding of what is going on uh, without seeing your faces and your expressions. So so um, I'll be giving you pop quiz in a minute, FYI. Um, uh, so that brings us to the issue at hand. You know, today's session we are looking at a particular aspect of uh, um, when we read literature, 
one of the things that we read it for is the issue of identity um, that is being portrayed in the text. Any story that you read, you know, any story that you watch for that for that matter. I mean, the issue of identity and how identity is being recognized, how identity is being valued and how identity becomes the mark from which others associate you, you know, that is an aspect of um, any kind of reading of literature. So for today, we're going to look at this aspect of identity. Now, I would like you to um, post on the chat for, for me, if you can. Otherwise, I will ask you individually. I would like you to answer this question. What are your identity markers? Um, what, if you like, is your sense of identity based on? Can I just give you a minute to write in the um, the conversation section? Okay, can you find it? Yes, um, yeah. but Doctor, could you pull back the the slide? Oh, sorry, where is it? Did I did I? Can you see it? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So the question is simple, basically. You know, all of us have a sense of identity, right, as, as a person. What is your sense of identity based on? Just what are your markers of identity? You know, um, is it your gender? Is it your nationality? Um, uh, is it your family line? You know, what is your identity? Is it your religion? Is it your culture? Is it your the group that you associate with? Um, think about think about that aspect of identity and what matters to you. We talked about this this last few book club uh, with the hate you give as well as um, born a crime. So I want you to kind of like you know start to. Uh, Itemize, if you like, what is the basis of your identity? Can I can I get some responses from you on the chat box? Did you see all of this, Doctor? All this? See that again? How we can write? Yeah, we write. We write. Uh, do you see the chat? Uh, for those of you who can't get to the chat, then uh, I will I will open it for your discussion. Otherwise, I just want you to just write it down. It says show conversation. Yeah. I just put the word here there. Can mm -hmm. you see it? Yes. Yeah. So just, just, just type me some words, some thoughts. What makes your sense of identity? Is anyone typing? I I can't, Doctor. Sorry. I'm not uh, able to type. Huda May can write on WhatsApp, Victor. If she can't write here. Okay. Is anyone else typing? Because I don't see anything right now. Uh, I find it and I will try to write on. For okay. her, she cannot uh, write. She cannot find. Okay, if, if it's too, if it's too uh, difficult in terms of that, writing it down, can I just hear some thoughts right now? Um, I think we are all of those you have told us, Doctor. But say it in your own words. I want to hear it in your own words. How do you define your sense of identity? I am Arab. I am Muslim. I am from... Uh, Mehdawi line, uh, and uh, I try my best to be on the right uh, uh, track. Um, okay, thank you. And uh, somebody else? I just Sir, you can talk or write. It, no, uh, since since it's taking too long, the writing part. Uh, just say it uh, orally. Okay. Identity marker that I'll put first is definitely being a mother first. Second will be probably my <clears throat> um, identity, Malaysian Indian. And the third, probably I would say that the career aspect of my identity. 
career, huh? Yeah. Right. First mother, second Malaysian, uh, Malaysian Indian, third is my career. Yeah. Okay. Right. Next. Thank you. Next. Um, can family be a part of the identity, like the fa the values that you carry? Uh, uh, just describe it to me and then we will kind of like conceptualize it because because you know there isn't a right or a wrong because what works for you might not work for others mm -hmm. you know but how do you define your sense of identity when, when you say family what do you mean uh, that's the thing I'm, I'm not really sure i i have um nationality and gender and age and that i'm a student mm -hmm. but um can you somehow fit like family in there, like being a part of family? Uh, you see, the, the value of what I am I am trying to, um, you know, the, the value of what I'm trying to get through to you guys is this, that um, when, when you are able to articulate to yourself, what is your sense of identity based on when you read the text and you see that in the text you are able to make connection with how the writer positions identity in that story which is why you need to be able to kind of articulate it either orally or in in the written word um, how identity matters to you in what form is identity manifested in your day-to-day uh, -day life? So I personally feel strongly about the, the institution of familyhood, uh, not mm -hmm. particularly because I had a, a wonderful experience growing up with it, but because I value it. That's my personal value. So I completely see what you are trying to say, Shahira, but I would like you to articulate it so that you for yourself begin to understand, okay, so this is how I am seeing family. Sometimes we don't realize it, but until we articulate it to someone else, you realize that, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize I held such strong um, opinions about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so tell, me, tell me your, your, uh, your identity marker. What do you mean by family? Do you mean mom and dad? Do you mean brothers and sisters? Is that what you mean? Yeah, like um, parents and siblings, so more to immediate family. And yeah. how um, sort of when you go outside, you are carrying their names as well. Okay. So that, that was I was thinking about the um, family being your identity. Yeah, so what, what am I hearing this right when you say that? That... Um, you you represent your family so that being the case your identity marker is everywhere you go you need to adhere to the fact that you're not just representing yourself you yeah. are also representing your family so when you think about identity marker to you it translates as who are you representing or what are you representing mm -hmm. would, would that be fair yeah yeah so think about that that you know sometimes you know you go out there thinking that I'm just being me, but you forget the fact that you are representing all these other markers of identity that is associated with you the minute you step out into the world. You know, by the sheer fact that you exist, you are in the, the public eye, you represent all these other markers of identity that is associated with you. That is that is one perspective. But in your case, you associate yourself with it. So it's good to be able to list down all the things that you associate yourself with that develops or defines your sense of identity beyond the name. So if you all just put the name, your name in the center of a page mm -hmm. and what that name symbolize, that you will have is a list of your identity marker. You know? Do you understand what I'm saying? Hello? Hello? Do you all get what I'm saying? Yes. 
So I, uh, I know it's, it, it tips into the, the realm of philosophy sometimes, but it's valuable to kind of think about this closely because then when you read a text, uh, especially when we read Animal Farm, which is a fable, it's just, it's just stories about animals and how an, this, this group of animals led by the pigs take ownership of the land you know, kick the man out and the farmer out and take ownership of the land and start ruling the land. It's, it's you know, that, that sense of, um, uh, that sense of, uh, uh, you know, what do these animals then represent? So it's, it's valuable to think about that first for yourself before you, you look at the text and say, ah, I understand what kind of identity is being developed here. All right, Jennifer, let's hear from you. What are your markers of identity? Ranjini, thank you. Shahira, thank you for posting it on the chat. I saw, I just saw. Okay. Uh, for, for my identity marker, I would first put I'm either a girl or a woman. And then I'm petite. I'm Malaysian Chinese. And because I'm Malaysian Chinese, I am a multilingual person. That's what I've been figuring out. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably okay. it. So, so I'm just writing it down. Sorry, I, I was listening. Um, so, so okay, good. Uh, so, so your physicality is important to you too, because you say you're petite. Did, did I hear that right? Yeah, because um, it, my physique, like how say being petite hasn't. It has been going on because it's not what I really identify it. It's what it had gradually become since I'm like say growing up. People have been commenting on my size until the point that I have absorbed it. I have taken it <laughs> part of my mm -hmm. um, identity, I guess. So I'm still, mm -hmm. I'm still figuring out whether this is what I think it is or mm. this is what people have put sure. it on to me. Sure. So yeah. so I, I'll just put it in first. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can relate because growing up, I was the tallest in the class. I was the tallest yeah. in the family. And, and, you know, I kept being called tall. Mm. And now my nieces, my daughter, my, my nephews, forget it. You know, they're all like so much taller than me, even at the age I was when I was quote unquote tall. So I, I come <laughs> and I'm like, gosh, I wish I was taller. You know, I, I love to be tall now. But back then it was such a pressure because you felt like, like you were the odd ball out. Because yeah. was, so I completely relate, but, but I'm not petite. I wish I was petite, but I'm not. <laughs> I think it's cute being petite because you get to buy clothes from all sorts of departments. That's true, but, but people often tend to ignore your opinion. Right. That's yeah, the bit so. I want to find. I, that's the bit I want to get to. That's that's the more pertinent. That's the identity politics part of it. When mm. somebody calls you petite, I'm just currently reading uh, Carl Sagan's Contact. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the novel. Uh, he's a physicist, astrophysicist. So, so oh. this chapter two, uh, the character, uh, uh, she attends Harvard uh, to study physics, and she says she needs to use her physics voice because her real voice is soft and 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 feminine, and the guys don't take her seriously. So, being petite, do you get that kind of association? People don't yeah. take her seriously. That's the bit. That's the identity politics part of, of identity marker that we need to understand. Right? Okay. Cool. That's good. Uh, who else? Uh, Ali. Yes, Doctor. For me, my identity maker is that I show that my nationality or origin and also social condition. Uh, anything around me also show clearly what is my identity because anyone around me can see uh, what I, uh, from from uh, which place I came from and uh, by also my behavior show the others what, what is my identity so uh, the, I think that nationality and origin represent me and represent my identity when you see social condition can you explain a little bit uh-huh uh, it's a present uh, 
exactly my identity that is uh, different from the others because everyone uh, has uh, his usual uh, social condition that mm. he tend to uh, behave or tend to use it or tend to uh, behave just like this way. Mm. Yeah, this is that show my identity and uh, clearly show the others that my religion is so or my origin or uh, uh, my identity is different from the others. Okay. Okay. All right. Now let, let's have a look at the chat. Uh, I've got some comments here. Uh, Ranjini says my identity marker that I will first put is definitely being a mother. And Ranjini, this has been your 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 eldest is three years old. Three and a half. Three and a half. So this is this is the last three and a half years. This has evolved, right? Prior to this, yes, being a mom was not high on your priority list. Yeah. 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 Second will be my ethnic identity, Malaysian Indian, and third would be my career. Okay, I I appreciate that because. Being a mother and and having a career can sometimes be at odds with each other. You know, it's almost it's almost like a, a, at the different end of the continuum. You know, being a mother, it's like your being your sense of identity is for the better of someone else, right? You're yeah. you're there for someone else for your children, and then having a career is for yourself, right? So so perhaps I don't know I could be wrong, but I appreciate that. Oh, oh yes, I'm a feminist. Okay, cool. Uh, we'll we'll talk more about that. What that means at another point. But but I appreciate that statement. Uh, let me put a heart to that. Okay. All right. <laughs> another heart there. All right. Cool. Shahira, my identity marker markers are being a Malaysian. Uh, my age and gender as a woman, as a young woman. My current stage in life as a student and my role as a daughter and sister. Um, I I want you all to kind of like, you know, be it someone saying that they are an Arab like Huda and Ali or somebody saying they're Malaysian or Malaysian Indian or Malaysian Chinese as uh, uh, Shahira, Ranjini and uh, Jennifer respectively have said. I want you to kind of break it down what that means to you. Um, what does being a Malaysian or being an Arab mean? Is it a passport that you carry? You know, I have an, an Iranian friend. I actually have quite a few Iranian friends. Um, uh, one of my friends, uh, you know, she, she, she just gets frustrated every time she tries to travel or, or go somewhere for a job. Um, having an Iranian passport gives her such challenge because of the politics associated with it, not because of her. She doesn't have any criminal record or whatever. She's, she's you know, um, she's a doctor of uh, philosophy. She's got a PhD. Uh, she's got she's got publications. She's a scholar. She's worked in, in Turkey and, and she's currently working in Oman. And, you know, and she's got she's got a lot of things going for her. But the passport kind of uh, puts a damper on her um, international identity. So when you all say you you kind of you associate with your nationality, be it an Arab or a Malaysian, Malaysian Chinese, Malaysian Indian, what does that mean? I want you to kind of like think about that with more detail. Uh, is it your passport? Is that what it means? You know, um, when do you use this identity? When when does this identity come up in your day to day life? Like when you go to buy bread, nobody asks, are you an Arab? Are you Malaysian Indian, Malaysian Chinese, Malaysian what? You know, nobody asks that question, right? When does this identity come up? Because later in the lecture, I want to talk about uh, politics of recognition. That's an important aspect of politics of recognition. What you are putting down here um, our identity, uh, uh, your de definition of identity at the personal level. This is how I personally define my sense of identity. But at the public level, how you are recognized by society, by, by the authorities, you know, that will also affect your identity. Okay, so I, I want you to kind of think about that. So Ranjini says, 
uh, which is why I really connected with Elizabeth Bennett. I was actually envious of her. She's a trailblazer. Okay, cool. Um, uh, of her time, I I will I will take this one step further. You know, I connect with Jane Austen. So you know, not Elizabeth Bennett. She's just a creation of Jane Austen. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, so Ali says, my identity marker is that I show it by nationality, origin, social condition, and anything around me shows cl show clearly my identity, even the way I behave. Okay, so so Ali's sense of identity is, is articulated through his behavior as well as his other choices in life code. Cool. And then Jennifer, my identity marker can be um, a girl stroke woman. Okay, uh, I won't call you a girl, Jennifer. Come on. Princess. No, that's it. I put it, uh, not a I put girl. it in. Because, because young people woman. around me, people around me, to be honest, if like if I'm in class, but if I walk out, I it's very hard like giving people the perception that if I'm 25, I'm a woman by, by social standards, but people don't see it that way. So people still treat me like a kid. Mm. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I look young or what, but it's just mm. when I try to say that, hey, you know what? I am, I'm a young adult. Please treat me like a young adult. But you people, know, I like that phrase. People still treat me like dot, 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 dot. Yeah. That's the element of recognition politics because in the in the context of the stories that we read how are people treating the characters and how the characters themselves see themselves might be two different things and that's the element of double consciousness which is also something i will bring up in the lecture and i want you to kind of know the difference how others are treating you if people treat you like you are lazy does that mean that's who you are yeah, that's if, the thing as well. If people treat you as in you are money minded, is that who you are? Will it become me? <laughs> that's what it's like. It's a fine line, right? That's yeah. and, then, and then over over a large group of people, when there is a large group of people, people say, Oh, you know, these these petite girls, they are like this, like this. That becomes a stereotype. Yeah, am I acting like that because this is what they have imposed on me? So I'm so, like, yeah. So, is yeah. this who I am? I, I need you to kind of, you know, the way we articulate our identity is the way others will respond to us. So yeah. it's the chicken and egg. Do you expect others to treat you differently uh, before you de behave differently or which one? Okay. Uh, at, the same, uh, at the same way, Doctor, at the same time, uh, I think that everyone also proud of his identity, whether he came from uh, Kurdish Arabia or Arab Kurdish, and also you can say Malaysian Chinese or Roma Malaysian Indian and so on. So uh, regardless of the treatment by the others, he at the, at the same time he uh, proud of his identity, whether he came from this uh, identity or this one. Uh, do you get it better? Yes, yeah, yes, I do. But I yeah. contest that. I contest that, Ali, because um, I, I grew up being criticized for my Indian background, mm -hmm. especially at school. I was called names, you know, uh, when I was growing up and I came to really dislike that part of my identity because I dislike being called names when I was growing up, you know, so yeah. so it's difficult to feel proud of your identity when your society responds to you in a negative way. I'm not talking about immediate family, like what Shahira was saying. Yes, it's yes. the minute you step out, I especially see, in see. a multicultural context, the minute you step out and how others treat you, especially if you are from a minority background, mm -hmm. how others respond to you can affect mm -hmm. the pride that you have towards that identity. So when you say the Kurdish are very proud of their identity, for sure, but are they proud for the way they are being treated by others? Of Maybe course. not. Yeah. Maybe as, not. We, as we see in the other countries, just like US and- Yes, uh, uh, the and, Rohingyans. Uh, how, how, yeah, how yeah. the black can be treated by their uh, Are they government? proud uh, of that identity? Yeah. Or are they yes, exactly. angered by it? Or are they yes. frustrated by it? Or mm -hmm. are they disappointed by it? There yeah. are many other experiences. 
So, so to be proud of your identity, you need to feel like your identity is helping you flourish rather than because of your identity, you are being brought further down. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so I appreciate this conversation, people, I really do. So, so Jennifer, I would say remove the girl part from the discourse <laughs> and make sure it's out, kick it out. You're not okay. a girl, you're a beautiful young woman. You. Is this yeah. like a Britney Spears song? I know, right? <laughs> yeah, it's stuck in between. Like, come on, man, people. You are not stuck in between. Everyone else is. So, you know, kick them out, you know? <laughs> Fine. Uh, so, Malaysian Chinese being a multilingual. I like that very much. That sense of my language also defines me, you know? How many languages do you speak? What are the languages that you speak? How does that define you? and your sense of identity and also your profession. Currently, you know, sometimes being a student might not be seen as an important profession, but it is a profession, right? So, so I like I like that also. Um, Excuse me, doctor. Yes. Uh, as for uh, Jennifer, I mm. called her a uh, princess mm. because she has this big heart. Ah, thank you. She's so kind. She, she's so kind. Uh, and w uh, even you don't uh, want her help, but she helps. She do very, um, very important things. Uh, she always be with you. Uh, I used to call her, you know. Even her voice is uh, cal calming. And as if I am talking with my youngest uh, sister, mm. she is like that. Mm. But uh, I don't uh, call her a princess because she has... Uh, uh, because she is, uh, you know, a little uh, girl. Yeah, yeah. Or, I no, 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 no. I just want her to understand that. I she completely has... understand. I, yes. I know why you're saying what you're saying because it, it may come across as if you're belittling her. Oh, you're such a princess. No, you know, no, sometimes no, you call no. the little babies such a princess. Really? Yeah, I completely really? understand. She is so dear and she is mm. so uh, huge in my uh, by her behavior and by yeah. her. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, morals. This is something uh, very uh, you can't find it uh, uh, every time. Um, mm -hmm. This is for Jennifer. As for me, doctor. Okay, group you... hug. Yeah, group hug. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Oh my God, thank you. Okay, wow, wow, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think you know the reason I'm I'm spending a little bit more time on this issue is because you know you have to realize that. When you read a text, you reflect yourself in the reading of the text. You reflect how you articulate your own sense of identity, whether you realize it or not, whether you have understood it or not, whether you have consciously thought about it or not, it comes across in the way you read uh, the, the works of fiction. You know what Ranjini says about connecting to Elizabeth Bennett, largely because she had thought she has she has taken time to think through. Ranjini has taken time to think through her own sense of identity. And hence, when she sees a character and is able to relate to the character, albeit the character is completely different, you know, a single woman, Caucasian from the Victorian era, from the uh, uh, Victorian era, you know, like, so removed from her, but you can still connect with that character. Why? Because there are aspects of the character's identity markers that you relate to. That's that's what I want you to realize. You have to begin with yourself. Whatever issues you are thinking about, be it death or love or, or you know, a lost, Ali, your, your video essay, anything that you are looking into for the purpose of research, Start with asking the same question with yourself. You know, what do I think about this? How do I relate to this issue? And then read the text because the story is written from a particular author's perspective and how the author relates to that theme is very personal to the author. And how you respond to that theme is also personal to you. In that conversation between you and the author and in his work or her work, is where the reader response comes through. So that's very, very important. Do not, do not ignore your own thoughts about the issue. Okay, don't go straight into the text. Ask yourself the important questions 
about it yourself, then relate to the text. I hope I'm making sense. Just well, so if you don't mind, yes. uh, if you don't mind, I want to uh, to say something about my uh, response. Sure. Uh, I uh, I say that I am Arab, I am Iraqi, I am Muslim, I am female. Mm -hmm. uh, I all these are you know there there this there is this uh, sorry uh, there are these stereotypes of about Arab about sure. Iraqi, about sure. Muslim, about female. So I think that I am facing uh, and challenging all these together. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to honor each one of these because these stereotypes that uh, the media uh, uh, said about Arab, about sure. Iraqi, about so and so. Sure. So I have to, I have to, uh, to be, to honor each one of these. I have to honor each one. So I am in, in such a challenge, even mm. in my family, my family rich and educated, and I was the orphan and the poor uh, between them. But I tried to honor the, uh, of course, the family of my mom, mm. because my father, I know nothing about them. They took uh, our inheritance and go away, uh, and inheritance. Them. So as for uh, for this, so I, I, I am in challenge, uh, I am in not an uh, unstoppable challenge that's why thank mm -hmm. you yeah so you see you see identity as a kind of a social uh, um there is a kind of a social responsibility that you carry with your sense of identity i respect yeah. that uh huda uh, uh ali says the same thing largely because of the kind of context that you all have come from so if i was going to read a text written by an iraqi writer that aspect might come across in his writing and I need to in her writing or his writing and I need to be able to appreciate that do you understand what I'm saying so I completely yes. understand where you're coming from largely from from your experience you are now uh, uh, having a kind of a social uh, responsibility to the way your identity is developed and defined you know, so I appreciate that very much. OK, moving on, um, you. You know, we, we looked at identity and I asked you this question just now. Sorry, I asked you this question just now. What are your identity markers? And, and I think we, we kind of we, we made a consensus that, number one, all of us have our own sense of identity markers and that identity mark, those identity markers are defined partly by our personal experience partly also by how society has responded to us and partly also by how we then respond to society, how we choose to respond to society. But something else that, that I think we need to keep in mind uh, is what uh, Finney talks about, this sense of how identity is not a homogeneous phenomenon. You know, when somebody says I'm Arab or I'm Malaysian or even I'm Malaysian Indian or I'm Malaysian Chinese or I'm Malaysian uh, uh, Pakistani or I'm Malaysian uh, Iban or whatever, whatever your hyphens are in your identity, that in itself is not homogeneous. You know, there are heterogeneity in that sense of identity, in that sense of collective, being a Malaysian, being an Arab. There are there are diversities even within that collective sense of Malaysian or Arab. Likewise, your gender is not homogeneous just because somebody says I'm a woman like what does that mean you know we've got how many women here we've got one two three four five women and a man in the class right now even even between the five women if if we all came up with the definition of what it means to be a woman we we'll probably come up with variance you know does being a woman entail being married? Does it entail having a children? Does it entail having a family life? Does it entail, what does it entail? Does it entail career? Does it entail being success, successful in your chosen field of, of work? You know, what does it entail? Does it entail the way you dress? Does it entail the way people relate to you? Right, so if people think that you, you you know, you're petite or you're, you're, you look young or you, you, you don't look your age, does that mean that's who you are in terms of your identity as a woman, 
right? So even that sense of gender identity is not homogeneous, yeah? So yes. when you are reading for texts across uh, national borders, you know, across geographical borders, you may ask yourself these kinds of questions. That one identity of being, uh, um, say, being black, represented from uh, one perspective may be different from another perspective, right? So there lies the heterogeneity of it. So identity is also a construct. That's something we need to remember. What does it mean, a construct? A construct is man-made, right? This notion of being Malaysian, being Arab, it's, it's not something that is natural, but it's something you, you were born in a particular locality, and hence you become an Arab. So if you had, uh, uh, born, if you were born elsewhere, you would have been that member of that society. Likewise, being Malaysian, you know, you were born in this locality, and hence you become a Malaysian. So you you embody that construct, the social, the cultural, the political construct, and even being a, a, somebody from a particular uh, religion. It's, it's a construct in a sense that you were born into that society, into that family, and you embody that, that faith, that, that way of life, that language. You know? So yes. that aspect must also be kept in mind. I want to draw your attention to uh, this notion of how sometimes, even though identity is non-homogeneous, writers, poets, scholars use that identity to create a kind of politics, to create a kind of statement, a political statement. In Langston Hughes's poem, I Too, he starts the poem by saying, I too sing America, I am the darker brother. So that's his identity. So out of the two, I am the darker brother. I'm not the whiter or the lighter or the fairer brother, but I'm the darker brother. So that idea of what the, who am I? I am the darker brother. That is a homogeneous identity, right? You, you've just given me a kind of a collective sense of identity that everyone who is darker, that's part of my community. I am the darker brother. But that line is a powerful statement because it's a political statement, mm -hmm. right? That aspect yes. is a political statement. In telephone conversation, this aspect of homogeneous uh, identity is being contested by this playwright, by Wole Sorenka. When, when uh, the persona goes to rent a room, uh, did we go through this poem? I thought we did, right? Yes, we did. We did, Just right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. Did, did we go through this a few weeks ago at the beginning of semester? Yes. 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 Yeah. So I'm just, yeah, I'm just recapping it. Okay, that's why I'm going through it fast. Uh, I too, we went through it as well. Um, this poem, we went through it, I know, uh, inshallah, but this one I can't remember. So in this poem, Telephone Conversation, the persona goes to rent a room and the, uh, uh, he's, he's on the telephone talking to the landlady. And, and after the conversation about the price, where location is and all the rest of it, the persona asks the landlady, or, or rather the persona makes a statement, Madam, I hate a wasted journey. I am African. Okay, mm -hmm. so that in itself is a homogeneous identity. I am African. African is a, Africa is a continent. It's not a nation, right? Uh, uh, it's it's made up of, of hundreds of countries and, and, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tribes and people from various backgrounds and, and you know, it, to, to just collectively say I am African, you know, the Egyptians, the Moroccans, the Tunisians, they are North Africans, the South Africans, the Nigerians, the Kenyans, the Sierra Leone, you know, these are all uh, Ghana, these are all parts of Africa as well. But to say I am African is a political statement in itself. So he's using it. So homogeneous identity sometimes can be used uh, to, to signal a political statement. You know, so I am African. And, and how does the woman, the landlady respond? First question she asks, not which part of Africa are you? Oh, nice. What are you doing in England? No, what's the first question she asks? How dark? Are you light or very dark? So it's a 
akin to Langston Hughes's homogeneous use of identity. I am the darker brother. Right now, this this poem, Langston Hughes's poem is 1926, uh, set in uh, America. Telephone conversation, um, I forget 1950 something. I forget the actual date. We'll find the dates um, on, on Google very easily. Uh, written by an African uh, uh, Nigerian poet um, uh, playwright set in UK. So I can compare these two texts in the in the uh, field of comparative literature. I can compare both texts. Both are poems. Both discuss the issue of homogenizing of identity. Yet the homogenizing of identity is done for a particular purpose. OK, to signal the politics involved in the respective society of how the darker skin gets treated by society. The darker skin in I2 is sent to the kitchen when company comes because they are quote unquote ashamed of me because I am darker. In this poem, the darker skin does not get the room to board. Not because of his education, not because all the identity markers that you have identified just now, you know, your your responsibility as a mother, your career, your age, your profession as a student, uh, your multilingual uh, abilities, your physicality, whether you're petite, whether you're, you're tall, whether you're broad shouldered, whether you're six foot tall or four feet uh, and a half your behavior, your choices, your tone, the way you speak, your tribe, your religion, none of that matters. What matters is the skin color. Uh, how dark? Are you light or very dark? If it's very dark, you're not getting the room. If you're light, you're getting the room. So do you see the point of how identity can be played in, in, uh, um, in the way society deals with us? Yes. Just, just say yes and then mute your phone, yeah, your mic. Yes, yes, Victor. Everyone okay so far? Okay. Yes, yes. Victor. Yes. All right. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yes. So, so that that is how you begin to look at identity. You know, the, the I'm only looking at one aspect, which is how identity is not homogeneous. It's not one. It's not one collective. There are diversity. Yet, these two these two poets, Wale Soyanka and Langston Hughes have chosen to use a more collective sense of identity to show the politics associated with it. Okay, how the darker tone in society are treated. Two different contexts, one in America, another one in London, in the UK, <clears throat> uh, one by African American, another one by Nigerian African, right? but both looking at the issue in the same way. All right. So, so when we talk about identity politics or politics of identity, you know, there are many aspects that we need to take into consideration. So how this quote uh, is, is of value, how do individuals understand who they are in political terms and on what basis do groups of people come together to advance common political aims? In other words, what are the source of collective political identity? That's what politics of identity defines. All right. So the politics of collective political identity involves struggles to define what groups are, uh, are made up of and which groups are full participants in the political community and which are marginalized or even ostracized. It also involves a kind of a this tug of war, you know, this this battle over who holds the position of authority and power, both symbolically as well as in reality. Are you all following this so far? Yes, Doctor. Yes, Doctor. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. I have a look at this Palestinian poet, and uh, both Huda and uh, Ali talked about nationality, you know, as an important identity marker. Um, when does 
let identity matter. I, I, I started asking you uh, just now as well, like you know, you, when you go out to buy bread or, or milk or eggs or whatever it is, or you know, when you do when you go and do grocery, do you need to signal your identity? Do you need to say, OK, you know, I am Arab. If any of you have gone uh, gone out to get stuff uh, during this MCO period, Lately, if you are allowed to enter the shops, you have either you have to scan the QR code and, and tell them where you are and what's the body temperature or you have to write it down in the book. Outside the shops, you know, you basically have to uh, identify yourself before you enter the premise, you know, like um, a couple of days ago, I went to the pharmacy to get some supplies for my mom and for myself and I had to write my name, my uh, phone number, and what was the other thing I had to write? Uh, my name, my phone number, the date, as well as they took my temperature and I had to write down the temperature in the book. But I didn't have to write my gender. I didn't have to write my profession. I didn't have to write whether I was married or single, whether I had children or not, uh, how tall I was, how many languages I could speak. All those are not, are not important. But listen to this line, the opening line of this poem. Write down. It's a command. It's an imperative. Yeah. The statement begins with a, a imperative verb. Write down. So I'm ordering you. So so that means the persona is speaking to somebody. You have that sense that the the persona is addressing someone, and and done with an exclamation. So it's like an order. It's, it's done in a in a very commanding voice. Write down. I am an Arab and my identity card number is and I have how many children yes. you know and that that ninth one is coming up soon you know in the summer so will you be angry it's like why does the persona need to reiterate these aspects of his identity what's the context keeping in mind what we said at the beginning reading a text on its own without putting the context around it is it's uh, pointless it's both tedious and unnecessary and un, un, non-beneficial so as you're reading even the first stanza you can already ask yourself who is the persona ident identifying with and who is the persona addressing and why does the persona need to define his identity markers in this fashion from nationality to his uh, identification card to his number of children he has right and the next stanza what else does he he identify as his identity markers and the next uh, stanza and the next stanza all right so how identity can be used is as valuable as knowing what that identity is. That is what identity politics deals with. So identity politics in comparative literature basically focuses on a particular group, the marginalized, the subalterns, the minorities, the disabled, the homosexuals, the, the various other denominators, various other groups, the, the religious um, uh, groups, the cultural groups, the social groups, the political groups, the gendered groups, right? So how the society uh, as a collective defines these groups and how they are, um, they are treated marks their identity politics, right? So within the context of uh, uh, the global society, you've got the migrant communities, right? You've got the um, refugees. You've got these kinds of terminologies that, that are used to define particular groups of societies, members of societies, the colonial societies, the post-colonial societies. How are individuals uh, defined by society is their sense of identity politics in that society. Now, I want you to, to uh, consider this important um, statement. Uh, this is from Charles Taylor's uh, um, a speech that he gave uh, back in 1994 uh, on the politics of recognition. You know, sometimes 
societies can society can also misrecognize us by giving us stereotypes by calling us names by by uh, identifying uh, us in a negative manner in a disparaging manner so this is a very significant quote of um, Charles Taylor that, that I want us to pay attention to. Our identity is partly shaped by recognition or its absence, often by the misrecognition of others. And so a person or a group of people can suffer real damage, real distortion, if people or society around them mirror back to them a confining, demeaning, contemptible picture of themselves. Non-recognition or misrecognition can inflict harm, can be a form of oppression, imprisoning someone in a false, distorted and reduced mode of being. You know, this last few weeks when we've been talking uh, through the, the four books that we have uh, discuss in our book club, uh, from the corpse washer to um, uh, the yellow bird, to the hate you give, to um, born a crime. This issue of recognition and misrecognition keeps coming back. Sometimes you may identify yourself in a particular way, but if others misrecognize you or recognize you in a contemptible way or in, in a um, in an ill-fashioned manner, do you accept that identity or do you resist that identity? You know, uh, that's something that I want us to kind of uh, think about and, and focus a little bit more on because this aspect is what will help us discuss and, and define identity politics in the text. So coming back to... to um, uh, Langston Hughes, you know, the politics of recognition can be seen even in the opening line, I too sing America. The fact that he defines himself and says, I also am part of this country and I also sing to the name America, right? I am the darker brother. Again, you have identified me in this way. And because I am the darker brother, you recognize that I can only eat in the kitchen when the company comes. But there are certain things that I do in response to the way you treat me, right? Because tomorrow, which means right now, this is not happening, but tomorrow, this is what will happen. So what's happening right now in the second stanza, that what's happening right now is you are ashamed of me and hence you send me to the kitchen when company comes because you don't want anyone to see me. There is that hint of that, right? But in the second last stanza, the persona recognizes something that is not being recognized onto him. The aspect of being beautiful, that is something that you can tell he is not recognized for. There is that absence. He's not being recognized for someone who is beautiful. There is that element of misrecognition. How do you know this? Because it has to it has to happen tomorrow. That means right now I'm not recognized for this. All right? So tomorrow they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. Tomorrow I'll be at the table. Tomorrow nobody will, will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. All these things will happen tomorrow. Currently, I am just the darker brother. That's my, that's the, the recognition that is being given to me. That is the kind of misrecognition, false, distorted, reduced mode of being, quote unquote, from Charles Taylor, that is being imposed on to the persona. Now, this persona, Maybe tomorrow something else will happen. But right now, this is what the persona wants to be recognized for. Being an Arab, having this identity card number, having this number of children, working in this place, reading these kinds of books, getting bread, um, you know, various aspects of his sense of identity defines him. 
is he being misrecognized? Is he having any kind of uh, um, false uh, identity imposed on him for sure, but is he accepting it? Not necessarily because he is making a statement here. Write it down, write it down, write it down. Three times he says that, you know, and at every moment, write it down. I am Arab. I'm not hiding away from it. I'm not shunning my identity. I am more um, accepting of my identity than you are of my identity. So I want you to kind of you know, look at the difference in in uh, how identity is homogenized and how the misrecognition of identity is being challenged by the poet of both poems. I too and um, identity card. OK, are you all OK with me so far? Yes, Dr. Yes, Dr. Yes. yes. Everyone OK? Yes, Dr. Yes, Dr. Yes, we're, we're almost done. Uh, so, so what is our challenge now as uh, 21st century students of comparative literature? What's our, what's the challenge that we need to take up? We need to shift the center. We need to shift the center from the Euro uh, America focus to a kind of a center that allows us to de deal with the issues that we find of value to us. So shift center taking up this uh, uh, this reference from um, Margaret Anderson and Patricia Collins. Um, shift, shifting the center means putting at the, and I quote, yeah, putting at the center of our thinking, the experiences of groups who have formerly been excluded, who have been made invisible through, through the course of how others have valued them. Uh, and and they are all typically done so they have been excluded or remain invisible. Why? Because they have been judged through the experiences of white people, not from their own personal experience. OK, uh, so that's that brings me to this concept of double consciousness uh, by W. E. Du Bois. Uh, OK, he wrote this. Um, statement, uh, this this essay, this extended essay uh, called The Souls of Black Folk and published it uh, in 1903. He's an African, he's, he's a, a person of color, he's, he's black, uh, published it in 1903. That's over a hundred years ago. Now ask yourself, as I'm reading this quotation, ask yourself to what extent is this idea of, of having this sense of two-ness, double consciousness removed from the experiences of people of color, the marginalized, the minorities? How far have we come? Are we still there or have we moved on from there? And this is, this is what double consciousness means. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in an amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body. You know, so, so that sense of Who's, what, what is your identity based on? I asked you at the, at the outset, you know, you all looked at nationality, your religion, your line, your, your um, profession, your, um, uh, your social condition, your environment, your behavior, your physicality, uh, your responsibilities in a family, be it as a daughter, or as a mother, or, you know, as a son. But have you ever considered having this kind of an identity where your sense of identity is defined not by what you think of yourself, but by how others look upon you? Jennifer started off uh, when she was looking at her identity as girl stroke women, largely from that premise, from the premise that this is how others have been viewing me, so maybe this is who I am. 
you know, and we've kind of kicked that to the curb and it's no longer part of our discourse. You know, if it is, we're going to come and, you know, ruffle your hair, Jennifer. So, you know, don't you dare use that anymore. Um, but that aspect of, of seeing yourself, always seeing yourself, looking at yourself through the eyes of others is something that um, people of, of the, the, the subalterns, the marginalized, have had to endure because they have come to realize that, hang on a minute, this is not who I am, but this is how I'm being treated. So this is, this is something I have to deal with. So I am the darker brother. I understand that you are ashamed of my beauty. You're ashamed of me. You send me to the kitchen, but tomorrow something else is going to happen. So I have this two-ness in me. I have this duality in me. I know who I am, but I know how you look at me as well. You know, and that's a kind of a responsibility I have to carry. I understand why you quote unquote understand. I don't quite understand, but I kind of understand why you sent me to the kitchen when company comes. Why? I said that in the third, in the one, two, three, fourth stanza. Because indirectly, Currently, you are ashamed of me, that you don't see me as beautiful, but someday soon you will. Right? I understand. Understand in that sense of that two-ness, that, that sense of duality, that sense of um, uh, being able to see how you look at me, but being able to also value who I am. Right? So that aspect of double consciousness is something we need to also bring up. Last week, when you were um, uh, last week and the week before, when when you all were talking about uh, the hate you give and born a crime, that aspect of how Star from the hate you give um, looked at looked at herself uh, from the way her schoolmates from the white back home uh, white background looked at her, and also from the people from her own neighborhood looked at her, you know, and and sometimes. She's caught in between. That is the element of this, this two-ness, you know? And that element of two-ness is in us, especially for those of us who are moving or oscillating from one space to another. And, and the two different spaces reflect back to us, mirror back to us um, a different sense of identity, you know? Uh, one group mirrors back to us uh, a more a positive uh, sense of identity and another group mirrors back to us a more um, maybe disparaging sense of identity. So how society mirror to us, mirror back to us, mirror back onto us, our sense of identity either help or damages our sense of self. But when we are able to kind of make this this distinction or oh, this is how you look at me and this is how i look at myself that kind of allows us to reconcile what is happening within us but at times as um as du bois says in the final statement in the final line of this this quote you know it takes a lot of strength not to be torn asunder by the two different forces. Who do you subscribe to? You know, Jennifer, I'm using, uh, um, I'm using your example not to kind of put you down anything, but I'm just using that example to illustrate. Okay? okay. So who do you subscribe to? Do you subscribe to people saying that you are this? It's almost like a girl-child kind of a uh, body and person that they don't take you seriously. Or do you subscribe to your own values of who do you think you are? And, and your values in the society and what Huda has just has I know Huda has just gotten to know you this semester and and she's given you have given her an image of yourself that she will carry with her forever right and people in your life have known you all throughout your life and they have this this very narrow perspective of you so who do you um, um, take up in terms of your sense of identity do you take up something that Huda says, or do you take up what others who have known you for maybe decades tell you who you are? That element, sometimes it just breaks us apart. It's too much of a, of a struggle to keep up with how others are seeing me and how I am seeing myself. If people keep telling you, um, 
that that you know you will amount to no good and you don't have what it takes to do whatever it is that you want to do you know you're not good enough if people keep saying this to you again and again and again after a while do you buy into that or do you say what Langston Yu says which is you know tomorrow I will do this right now I can't because this is how you value me but tomorrow I will do this that means do you have the element of hope in you and where does that element of hope come from that is something you can ask this persona too now how do you know this is what's going to happen tomorrow where where do you get that that hope from right Langston Hughes was was one of the big names in the Harlem Renaissance um, uh, movement so he drew from that strength most probably but those who are the subalterns those who are uh, in a situation where they are not given the um, the the opportunity, um, you know, how do you make that kind of statement, uh, Mahmoud Darwish? He speaks on behalf of his society. He's the mouthpiece of his society. He spoke rather. He spoke on behalf of his society. Likewise, Wale Soyenka. Likewise. Langston Hughes, they speak on behalf of their society. They are the mouthpiece of their society. But are members of their society experiencing this kind of hope? Maybe not. All right. But that's that's the reality of it. Yeah. As as scholars, as students of literature, when we talk about um, comparative literature and we talk about the issue of identity politics, you make the choice. What are the texts you choose to compare from? Uh, uh, you know, you've got a list of texts. You've got you know a whole range of texts you can choose from. Choose your texts accordingly. That allows you to make these kinds of important statements. So, so these are very, you know, very limited uh, uh, choice. I when I put it down, I was like, oh my god, this is just one female writer. You know, the feminist and Ranjini would probably want to have me, you know, <laughs> put on trial. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't I, I didn't mean to do it this way and I was like oh shoot you know uh, but yeah there are other writers there are other female writers you may bring that up uh, but uh, this is this is just a list a very quick list but you may compare writers across uh, uh, national and geographical borders so you've got Wale Soyanka's poem the Nigerian poet, you've got the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Dawish, identity card, you've got the African American um, uh, poet Langston Hughes. So just looking at the poets and the poems, you can compare these three contexts, right? You can take two or three, you can just compare. Or you can look at the novels. We've studied um, Born a Crime uh, and uh, The Hate You Give. So you've got the um, South African, uh, Born a Crime by Trevor Noah, and the African American, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. So you can make the comparison between the two. And then there are other texts, uh, Things Fall Apart by Cheno Achebe, the Nigerian um, Cheno Achebe. You've got the Malaysian, The Return. Um, for those of you who are doing Malaysian Literature in English next semester, we, we will be studying that. Those of you who have done Malaysian Literature in English with me um, last semester, we have studied that. Uh, so, you know, there are there are other texts that you can bring up, but the issue at hand is what is identity politics and how do you define it and how do you incorporate that into your discussion? You make that decision. OK, I'm nearly done. Um, I'm going to open it to Q&A. OK, do you have questions for me? Hello. No, no, no. Okay. It's been it's been quite heavy. I know an hour and a half. You know, I know it's been it's been a bit heavy. Um, but we can unpack any of these things that we have discussed in you know uh, in late later sessions as well. But I just want to kind of give you a, a kind of a, an overview when we look at the issue of identity politics. It's a very complex issue but at the heart of which is this aspect of between a homogeneous sense of identity and a heterogeneous sense of identity it's that 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 tension 
is your sense of identity just one collective sense of identity, your nationality, your religion, your culture, uh, your role, uh, your, your profession, or even within that, do you have a kind of heterogeneity? You know, research shows, your reading also shows that there isn't one collective identity, but the collective identity can be used for a particular political um, goal, a particular political end. There is a reason how we use this to reach a political uh, uh, conclusion, you know, to champion a, a particular cause, a struggle or sorts. So there are times the homogeneous identity, you know, when when some of you says I know I associate or, or rather I define myself by my ethnicity. There are times uh, that identity is useful, is valid, is necessary. But there are other times when you say you want to move away from that and, and have a more uh, unique, personalized sense of identity. So we oscillate between these two, you know, between the more collective and the more individual uh, sense of identity. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm open to any any discussions that you may have regarding this topic. If you have any questions for me, did you write down any questions, anyone? Thank you, Tara. No. No. Thank you, Tara. Okay, but but did you understand the lecture? Of course, clear enough. Yes, Thank you. Okay, are you sure? Yes, Victor, of course. Okay. Revision. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I will. I will. Um, I will just stop the recording because uh, I don't want to make the recording too long. Um,